through a literary sensibility. During the 70s, uh, Richard read and spoke at a number of institutions, including the University of California in Santa Cruz, SUNY at New Plots, Franconia College, Kent State, the Chicago Poetry Festival, West Virginia University, Kaiser State, St. Mark's Church, and uh, it goes on and on. Grossinger has also studied Tero, Tai Chi, Hinsing One, Craniosacral Therapy, Qigong, Dream Work, Bioenergetic Therapy, Lomi Work, Gestalt Movement Work, Brima Classes, and Yoga. And more recently attended Psychic Kindergarten at the Berkeley Psychic Institute and then continued his psychic studies from there. He's currently coordinating a psychic group seasonally when he is in Maine. And without further ado, Richard, welcome back to the other side of midnight. Well, we've been going for quite a while. There's so much to gather up and uh, I don't know really quite where to begin. <laughs> that was my well, question. Uh, like where, with this incredible smorgasbord. Well, first of all, I think you read um, a, uh, a biography from about 20 years ago. I'm not, not quite, I mean, these things stay around. So, um, but whatever, uh, it, it's a little bit out of date, but I actually live in Bar Harbor, Maine now. Okay. Don't, don't live part-time in Berkeley. But I did meet Richard in Berkeley in the mid-80s, and that's more interesting to deal with than my biography. <laughs> um, and there, I, I actually met him at the moment at which I wrote and had published. Yeah, he, of um, course, is see, not here, so he's being referred to in the third person. What? <laughs> um, uh, well, I met Richard um, because I read an article in the newspaper in the San Francisco Chronicle about his work with Mars and I had just published a book on kind of astronomy, astrology. That was the Night Sky book, Soul and the Cosmos. Yeah, the original, the original version of it before it was subtitled Soul and Cosmos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I thought, well, this guy turned out to live only a handful of blocks from me and so we began talking and we got together and eventually I discovered he needed somebody to help him with publishing that book and so it happened but now that we're what 35 years later is, I, is that the quick math correct Good. Um, How time goes um, now that we're that much later I kind of reflect back Richard asked the question, what did I see in it? Of course, that's false modesty because it was um, a kind of brown, groundbreaking book at the time. Whatever you think about the mo monuments on Mars, the face on Mars, Sidonia and so forth, um, he, by raising the questions that he did at the time, he started many, many separate discussions and layers and levels of discussion which have matured over the years and gone down different trails. And all of that could be felt almost hauntingly in, in his writing that. Um, and the book was a haunting book and it, it, it's hard to even know what genre it was. It was <laughs> speculative science it was science fiction. It was um, kind of terrestrial archaeology. That's all. And it was extra okay, extraterrestrial archaeology. But Richard and I check in at various distances. Sometimes a decade passes. Sometimes only a year or part of a year. But we have checked in over time. And in visiting with him tonight him in New Mexico and me in Maine, um, I, was, uh, I was musing about what, what is really exceptional about his work. Um, and so I told him I wanted to give my view of that um, <laughs> because I've really, it's the only way I can kind of get located in this discussion 
um, because Richard builds up a head of steam and momentum and throws so many curves at you all at once that you barely can start down one before the next one comes. So I'd like to kind of cut through some of that and just say that here are the things that really kind of stand out long term. Um, number one, I, I don't think it's whatever Richard thinks and he can speak for himself. I don't think the bar, all, all these issues will be finally resolved in our lifetimes, nor do I think that that's really what his achievement is, whether the relative truth or ver veridicality of any one thing. I think when he started with Monuments of Mars, when you started with Monuments of Mars, Richard, to not talk about you in the Oh, third hi there. Day. Yes, yes, I'm right over here. When you started on Monuments of Mars, what you did, which was unique, was to look really closely at another planet um, and ask questions that nobody was asking. And the, the people who weren't asking the questions were exactly the people who were supposed to be asking those sorts of questions. And you cut through all that and posed alt alternate, alternate narratives um, that came from extremely close observation of, um, of an, another planet's surface, the kind of observation that just wasn't being done. Instead, what you had were people projecting um, their kind of, uh, they were projecting their image based on what they either presumed that they would find or what it looked like on Earth or one thing or another. And you, you went a totally different route and said, let's really look at this from the standpoint of another paradigm, um, the possible habitation of Mars, and then later the um, possibility of different kinds of energy fields and planetary cataclysms and so forth. Now, some people may think that's um, valid, and other people may think that it's completely um, fabricated and, uh, and, and, and like just inflated out of nothing. And it, it, to me, it doesn't matter at all either way because it's not going to be resolved uh, definitively. Oh, let me interrupt it's you. <clears throat> yes, it will be. <clears throat> and long before you and I shuffle off this mortal coil, the rate of the increase of accessibility of the solar system to ordinary people, I go back to my news item on Musk, is asymptotic. It is going through the roof. It's it even exceeds the uh, the rate at which this uh, <clears throat> mRNA um, uh, you know virus uh, modality was was invented in kind of like a year with a 17 year you know lead time. The point is accessibility, cheap accessibility to the solar system is going to make it possible for ordinary folks, beginning with the moon, to verify everything I've ever claimed. And of course, the physics itself, which is a separate thing that has to be done in laboratories. I mean, there's a very famous guy. He used to be head of the astronomy department at Harvard. His name is uh, Abby Loeb. And he's written a book, a whole book, on the extraterrestrial archaeology of Oumuamua, this first singular object that came into the solar system clearly on an interstellar trajectory whipped around the sun then left never to return and he and i are all uh, only one of two people two of two people who have looked at this data and said oh my god this thing was artificial the thing that Loeb focuses on as the key modality for differentiating between the natural object and the artificial object which was the anomalous motions of a Muamua as it left the solar system, which are so non-Newtonian, so non-relativistic, so non-any mainstream theory that Loeb and his colleagues created one model, which can be easily falsified, and I have created, based on the physics that I learned in the geometry of Sidonia, a totally other model, which can be tested, and when I get Loeb on the show, which we will do, 
I'm going to propose that he, with the resources of Harvard College, can in fact, in the lab, demonstrate the physics and attach it to Oumuamua, Mua's anomalous motions, and so the revolution is not going to be decades away, or maybe even a decade away. Richard, you and I are going to, in the next three or four years, see a stunning confirmation of a whole bunch of outrageous things that I have said. Okay, well, my point was that it didn't matter that what was See, and I can't understand how you as a scientist can say it doesn't matter unless you're approaching this purely as an intellectual, metaphysical, etericist, es esotericist uh, guy who, which one of the reasons why I kind of, you know, like what you write, because you think outside the box like I do. Well, I... I I don't identify myself as a scientist. I mean, I, I find science interesting, but not the most interesting thing. And um, I, um, I, I always liked a line that my philosopher friend from years ago, Andy Lugg, said, which was, he commented on my using science in my writing. He said, um, he said, science interests you, it doesn't interest me. I figure things have to work somehow and, it, and, and I could care less how they do. Mm. And I'm sort of, from a material standpoint, that's sort of where I am too. I think everything you say is in some ways much more interesting than you think it is because you think it's interesting if it can be proven. And I, I don't think it. I don't think it can or will be proven. Um, and, I, and I. Oh, I could make a lot of money on this one. <laughs> <laughs> with, with who? And the I Enterprise think, mission um, could use it. I think um, I, I think um, is really interesting. It was kind of though a whole separate topic. I think that's one of the things that's hard about the dialogue is that we have you know, like 11 separate topics going at the same time. And um, you could tie them all together. Well, that was another thing I was actually going to credit you with. Um, you, you were very prescient and precocious in opening. This is a very subtle point and hard to make, so I don't even know if I'm going to pull this off. You were very um, prescient in seeing that science in that, that it's not just mars or nasa or for that matter the COVID or wuhan or whatever it's that the entire scientific paradigm is shot through with flaws with political overlays and with um professional um goals that are put ahead of the actual science, whatever that is. You read that and demonstrated it in terms of Sidonia 35 years ago. And in doing that, you set, uh, you, you set kind of the template for um, ensuing generations to find the same sorts of pileups conspiratorial, quasi-political um, sort of mishmashes created by scientists who I think some are well-intentioned, some are think they're well-intentioned but are actually pro professionally or politically motivated. Others are probably not well-intentioned. But you read all that at a time when people actually believed that that science was uh, an honest broker, and that was the second thing you did. You you um, you opened it up. God knows it's it's going crazy now mm. to the extent that um, people are. I think people believe that you can pretty much make anything up and get it to get it to fly, which is a whole other thing. Um, and I would go back to your original Monuments of Mars and point out that, um, how to say this so it's not going to sound insulting to you, <laughs> um, when, 
there's a certain way in which your proposal of Sidoni was like the forerunner of QAnon. Um, not in the sense of a manipulated conspiracy theory, but in the sense of a populist response to um, being fed um, scientific information that had as its ultimate purpose uh, kind of kind of enforcing power dynamics rather than pure empirical analysis. I don't know if I kind of got that right the way I want to. I guess in a simpler sense, what I want to say is that, um, and this goes back to my original point, which I know you don't like, <laughs> that it doesn't matter if the whole Sidonia thing, as you yourself um, said at the very beginning, turns out to be a pile of rocks, because there's something else. There's the creation of a much larger archetypal mythology which simply rings true. There's the, for all the, um, for all the fables and conspiracy theories and myths and whatever that you've created, when, even if one doesn't believe them literally, they ring true. And that's where you and I go in very different directions. You, you think these things will be confirmed and that even it even matters whether they're confirmed or not, I don't think they will be confirmed, and I also think it doesn't matter, because I don't think it's where the rubber meets the road. Mm. Um, I, I don't know who the guy was suddenly talking about uh, agriculture and seeds. Oh, we have a, we have a companion program that's on Friday nights called The Other Side of the News, and Kinthea uh, and her colleagues produce that separately from the other side of midnight and that was a guest that they had on I think a couple of uh, Fridays ago and he represents something called ice farming and I haven't followed it closely yeah. but obviously he has the you know perspectives that nasty evil horrible corporations and governments are going to enslave humankind by forcing us all to eat uh, processed stuff grown in vertical farms in, in cities and one of the things I pride myself on this um, network we're I think doing that's that's interesting. Well, I, I want to provide a, a panoply of voices, a diversity of voices, many of whom I do not agree with, but I certainly agree in the, in the First Amendment. So that's why, you know, Kintia can pick the guest she wants to put on, and all I ask is documentation, and people do come up with documentation. So it opens the dialogue. You know, I'm, I'm for opening as opposed to closing options, models, ideas, because we need more out-of-the-box thinking or the human race really is doomed. I mean, that's one thing I think you can, you and I can agree on, that if we don't, if we keep doing the same thing we've done, which is the Einstein definition of insanity, we're all gonna die. And that's why I think space and the fact that we have an extraordinary suppressed history, when we can prove it and we're not that far away, in contrary to your perception, I think it will change everything for the simple reason that at the core of every human being, I don't care whether they're Chinese or North African or you know Maltese or American or French, whatever, is the is the need, the desperate need of identity to know who you really are and where you came from. And the whole human race has been snookered with a huge lie about where we came from. And that lie will be turned to dust with the first confirmation like the whole UFO thing out of the Pentagon, the first confirmation by some mission. It may not be us, it may not be the Chinese, it may be a total, pri it may be Musk himself, because I have a strong suspicion based on, you know, political evidence and media evidence and interviews he's done and tweets he's made, that Musk knows everything we know about Mars and then more, and he's not saying a word because it isn't politically timely. Well, I, um, I th I've always been interested in space and planets, and I had a Mars scrapbook as a teenager, and oh, I could go on with stories about my own interest in it, and I've written about it. But I don't, I don't feel 
that the answer is going to come from outer space um, or that um, or that it's nearly as interesting as what's I mean inner space is a really silly way to put it it's a cliche but I think that there and I and I think this about UFOs that that there's more and kind of interdimensional or transdimensional reality that expands right here. You don't even have to go as far as the moon. It's embedded in the dimensionality of the Earth and the sun. Well, you're talking and, about the hyperdimensional physics model. Well, you are. I'm not, I, I wouldn't call it a hyperdimensional physics model. I would, I would just say that, that we ourselves are attuned to all sorts of fields and energies and intelligences that we have blocked out. And that's the hyperdimensional physics model, yes. In um, fact, many times I've said the reason we're in such extremists here, Richard, <clears throat> the physics is broken. It's not the way it should be. And as we get later in the evening, I'm going to bring up some evidence that I want to bounce off you and see what your reaction is. But if the physics under which we are living is broken, either inadvertently or deliberately, then the connection between consciousness and the field and the larger gestalt and the universe itself is not the way it should be. And that's, I think, explains why you have these widely divergent experiences and reports from some people who get it, who feel it, who, who um, what, what's the, what's the, uh, ah, what? Heinlein, Grok, who Grok it, and those that don't, they can't. Right, and the, and, and on that, you know, we more or less agree. Oh my God, he we, just said it. <laughs> Tell you what, um, hold it there, we are at the uh, bottom of the hour, or, no, I, I, are we at the bottom or the top of the hour? No, we're at the top of the hour, yeah. My clock's correctly. So hold it there. My guest this morning is Dr. Richard Grossinger, who, as you can tell from his uh, out-of-date bio, God, the things he's done recently, <clears throat> is kind of a generalist. And though he holds a degree in anthropology, I guess he doesn't think that anthropology should begin in testable empirical science, or maybe he does, I don't know. That's one of the reasons I wanted him on again tonight, because we have so many things going on on the planet, so many divergent strains of developments of all the stuff that people are trying to figure out as they're trying to survive and to prevail. And we'll get back to all of that when we come back. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall return.
And welcome back, everyone, to the other side of midnight from the land of enchantment, the land of the West, what used to be thought of as the final frontier. And now, of course, we turn our sights just a little higher. And there's all kinds of frontiers. And you know, Richard, I do agree with you that many of them are internal, inner space, as the 70s term was. But what I found that brings both together is that someone left us a set of monuments, a set of geometries, an instruction book for how the universe really works. And how do I know? Because it can be, and it has been tested. And the only reason it's not having this extraordinary cultural revolution on the planet yet is because it's not been officially acknowledged. But when you have diversity, when you have uncontrollable thousands of people spreading across the inner solar system, which is going to happen in not decades, but in the next few years. Everything that's perceivable, that's documentable, that's photographable, and is unstoppable because it's all coming down in social media, it's all going to hit everyone at all kinds of different levels. And again, I think the resonant message when we figure out who the hell we really are and why we're here. I think that cannot help but have a profound change. And it will be responded to by all kinds of different people at different levels. But that's how social transformations take place. Like the Renaissance, discovering something brand new that has been unthought of by 99.99% nine percent of people who think the human race in its current form originated here on earth a la evolution or god and when they find out that evolution is a little different than they've been taught and that god may be very different than they've been taught there will come the revolution so sorry i go on well, it's always interesting. I, you know, the, we all think in many layers and, and frames uh, simultaneously. I can, I can get interested in that and picture that and have some enthusiasm about it, but it's not what strikes me as the most interesting or, or I mean, it's not the thing that's most interesting to me. What's more interesting to me is that, uh, I mean, you can locate it anywhere you want. I, I think it's, uh, as a shorthand, I would call it a kind of Sethian perspective, um, the, the channeled entity Seth's view of the universe, which is that this entire display that we're looking at is a camouflage universe, and that there's a whole other field within it that explains why we're here and what we're to do here and to use your phrase who we are um, I my own view which is so kind of I mean the, this is like sound bitey talk rather than uh, getting to it by some sort of um, developmental pattern it is that we are we collectively um, and this includes not just humans, but animals and plants and so forth, all create this reality. The, I call it a thought form. I, it's not my term, but I borrow the term thought form. That, that we create a, this consensus thought form, which we then manipulate collectively through our consciousness and through our dreams. And that it's one of many, many possible thought forms and it will eventually dissolve and we as the originators of the thought form will create other thought forms and that this whole big starry universe which is really magnificent is more like an exquisitely created psychic reality than it is the hardcore solid you know groundwork of everything um, and so I but that doesn't mean I'm not interested in it in exactly the same way you are it's just that it's not it's not where I land I, I'm much more interested 
in how one develops their own layers of perception so that you begin to read this bigger thing. And I consider myself a really rudimentary student of that and come to it very late in my life. But nonetheless, I place enormous value on that. And I can pay attention to all this other stuff you bring up and I think is fascinating. And why not another renaissance? Um, it does, to me, it doesn't look like that. It looks like we're in much bigger trouble um, than, than that. And that there's... Well, that's uh, why I use the term often game changer. Mm -hmm. um, way back when, long before I met you, I was introduced to futurists, people who actually you know, are consultants to corporations or governments to try to predict the future. Obviously, for corporations, if you can break the future, you can make a lot of money, right? It's mm -hmm. like if you had a time machine, you could go and get the baseball scores for 20 years ahead and bet on every, you know, winner in the National League. Um, so futurism became a big item in the 70s. And I was introduced to, you know, the creme de la creme. And they, they told me, one guy in particular told me, he says, futurism can be divided into three views of the world. He said... Most people, <clears throat> their view of the future is if this goes on. So if you can think of a graph with a vertical and a horizontal set of lines, their view of the future is take any date, that date tomorrow and next year and next month and you know 10 years will be basically the same as it is now. All right? That's generally people's view of the future if this goes on. The second category, he said, is, you know, people who think they're futurists and they draw on the graph a flat line going up at some angle. It can be a shallow angle. It can be a steep angle. But this is where we get the idea, you know, like such and such a culture is 100 years ahead of us in time. You've heard that, I presume, many times, right? If we meet aliens, they could be 100 years, 1,000 years, you know, that kind of thing. That's the linear curve where, where the line goes up at some predictable rate. And so if you take the time and you plot it on that graph, you know, if cultures, if, if discovery and insight and inspiration and social change occurred on a predictable algorithm, you know, flat line, elevated, that's how they get that, you know, such and such is so many ahead of so many years ahead of us or behind us or whatever. He said, this is my, my tutor, I think it was the uh, Futures Institute there in Middlebury, uh, Connecticut. He said the real futurists realize that the future is not linear. It's certainly not tomorrow will be the same as today. It's asymptotic, meaning the curve starts out shallow and as it goes further ahead in time, you know, moving, let's say, right on the graph, it begins to go vertical and then straight up. And so you can't quantify in terms of time any culture or civilization or technology is so many years ahead because all it takes is one insightful discovery which changes everything and catapults you into an asymptotic where things change at the rate of several times per week or per month or sometimes even per day. And that's the inflection point, Richard, I think we're at, where do not forecast the future based on what's been happening or what happened 10 years or 20 years or 100 years ago, because the future is not predictable that way. It's, it's sudden, incredible jumps. The, the very famous evolutionary biologist, uh, Stephen Gould at Harvard, had a theory for evolution called punctuated equilibrium, where he basically coded this idea, that the future is not linear, into a set of stunning, incredible leaps in the evolutionary record where there were no intermediary things changing into other things, into other things, you know, the kind of Darwinian, you know, futurist model where it's a linear curve. He said, evolution really occurs in these stunning, incredible breakthroughs that make whole families of species obsolete overnight 
and bring in all new species. Of course, he didn't understand uh, at that time why that happened. Uh, I think it's due to the physics, but that's another discussion. The point is, I think we're on the eve because of the way the physics has been arranged and the way the alignments of the stellar and planetary systems are and where we are in the processional cycle. I think we're at the level of where we could see the birth of another golden age, a la the you know, Indian Vedas. The Vedic model seems much more appropriate to how to predict the future than the Victorian linear, linear it's always getting better at a predictable rate model. Well, that's cheery. <laughs> and testable. You just have to hang on a little longer, as my grandmother used to say, when you reach the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I, it's, well, testable. I'm not sure what that means, but, but I, I do think. It means you're going to live to see it. You're going to experience it. We all are. If I, I, and I think I, the UFO thing is a harbinger of things to come. I mean, you wanted to talk about UFOs tonight, right? Sure. So let's dive into something specific. How do okay. you see the specific foment and revolution and incredibly heretical things being said all over the mainstream media and press by people who wouldn't be caught dead talking about UFOs three days ago? I'm being, you know, I'm kind of exaggerating. Right. Yeah, it's enjoyable. Um, I don't think that anybody has said anything really yet. Um, they're... The, the most interesting part of it is that they all acknowledge that they're physical, real objects that are doing things that no physical, real object can do. Okay. Um, he right said, there, he said in, interrupting, you know, the doctor again. But, Richard, that's the whole ball of wax, right? You said the quintessential magic words. The doctor can come down and pay you $200. Remember the old uh, uh, Harper Marks thing? Uh, gradual words. Um, because the biggest, the biggest restraint on human evolution that I've learned over my however many decades I've been doing this is the lack of imagination. What you can't imagine, you can't make real because you'll never test it. You'll never try it. You'll never experience it. You'll never venture your toe into the deep ocean. If you can't imagine it, for you it doesn't exist. The very thing that's kept the whole UFO space, who are we, what's on other planets, all of that in the closet has been the establishment and the governmental media, you know, very evil conspiracy to keep this beyond the pale where it could not be considered as another aspect of life. That lid, as I laid out in great length with my guest last night, has been lifted. And with the lifting of that lid, there is nothing that cannot happen at an incredible accelerated rate because we've been kept down on the farm, or as Alex Jones calls it, the prison planet, by the forced, relentless suppression of the reality of what's going on all around us. Well, that's... Uh, <laughs> I too much richard I, I, it's like it's going in all directions at once and i'm not sure which one to chase but i i like all the ufo stuff without buying into some of uh, the metaphors here but the um I, well what do you and, like and about it, it you say you like it what do you like the, about it but the, the, the fact that the fact that the same thing you like which is that the switch has happened that the I'm not sure that the switch has happened because these people are fascinated by the real possibilities. What most people are saying is, is more along the lines of uh, something's violating our military space and we better know what it is. Um, and it's all being uh, kind of legitimized in terms of a military threat still. But isn't um, that the way it would happen in our 3D reality? Yeah. I mean, um, can you imagine it being Gestalt, where suddenly we realize there are angelic beings from Alpha Centauri <clears throat> who've been amongst us and we can't see them because they're at a different frequency? No, it has to start just a little bit further of where we are now. 
but it's the rate of the acceleration. And last night we spent three hours discussing what's going to happen next and then after that. And I'm forecasting, along with other folks that have looked at this, that what you're going to see is an uncontrollable change of perception and imagination and all the careful, oh, it's not our stuff, it's not really new physics, it's some unknown agents, maybe China, maybe Iran. No way. People are going to zap to the obvious. Come on, guys, it's extraterrestrials. Now, let's get on to why are they here, who are they, and why do they give a damn about us? Um, I, I don't know that it's extraterrestrials. It's, um, it's, well, could I say uh, extra-dimensional? Will that make you happier? Are, um, well, only in the sense that, that it, um, it allows a wider range of... Okay, uh, I'm, of I'm totally willing to go with that. Of, to ...of getting here. Totally willing to go with that. Yeah, I mean, I do think that an enormous paradigm shift is about to happen. But I, and, I, and this even plays a role in it. But I don't think that, to me, that's not exactly the paradigm shift that I'm seeing. I'm seeing more, I have a friend actually who, a longtime friend, even longer than I've known you, goes <coughs> back to when I lived in Vermont in the 70s, who's now hanging out in Albuquerque, um, mm. Elias Lonsdale, who is a, psych, a, a psychic and does wonderful astrology readings for people. And he, um, he was, we talk maybe once a week or every other week, and he was remarking, and it's just language. It's, it's not exactly what it is, but he was remarking a couple of days ago that everything has already changed, and we're already living in this whole different world, only the facade, everybody is wanting to return to normal. They, they want to go back to the old normal. And so the facade is still there because it's our consensus reality. But everybody, and, I, and many, many people talk about this. People I talk to pretty much worldwide on, over a span of months remark on the fact that something fundamental has already changed. COVID had something to do with it, but it's not just COVID. And COVID, in a sense, is subsidiary to the, to the change. I mean, the, just like the political stuff, which has attracted so much attention, mm -hmm. is also a symptom of the change rather than the cause. Um, and it's like... See, it's nothing, like, Richard, you're saying is surprising, because I've been saying it on the show since I went on the air on day one, which was in July 20th, 2015. The physics is changing. Consciousness is linked to the physics. In the common vernacular, we're talking vibration. COVID may fit into that because we suddenly became susceptible to that which we were not susceptible to before, or someone is using it as a, as a weapon to try to strike at the heart of the paradigm shift and the consciousness change. They're all together because it's not coincidence. It's linked to this changing physics in my mind. And obviously, in your friend's model, because when you said, you know, we're not seeing the changes yet, no, I think it's all around us. It's just invisible because there are a lot of people desperately clinging to the old paradigm. Well, it's not it's not your model or my model or his model, because I don't think that there's a model for it in that sense. And I, the word physics bothers me in this regard. Why? Um, um, well, for one, because because in some ways you're totemizing it um, in a way that I, I don't a agree with. Um, I think physics and mathematics are are themselves systems that have been created within a certain framework, and that there are other systems of measurement and understanding that um, are well everything's rooted in everything else so i won't say they're not rooted in physics in any absolute sense but you don't arrive at them by getting a physical model it's i, I what i'm striking at and that's just because you and i have known each other and been talking 
for a very long time and debating and this and that, but, but we always kind of run, run a little bit aground uh, over this difference in perspective. And yet there is obviously like some sort of core empathy and um, an intuition that like a kind of magnetic field holds us in the same dialogue. Um, so that we don't completely fly off into other universes from each other. And that's interesting to me. It's interesting to me that we still have terms in which we can talk to each mm. other, even though we process information and go through it in a different way. And by the way, um, I, I consider it a little silly to be called Dr. Grossinger. Why? I, I, well, why? Because it, it simply refers to the fact that back in the, like, 70s, I got a PhD in anthropology, which doesn't qualify me any more than you who did go, you know, to um, get all that education. You, and, and these days, I think just young people are discovering that what college is about is spending an awful lot of money to get a credential that you can earn in all sorts of other ways. And you proved that half a century ago. So that you could, um, that you could learn off the street and, uh, and, and, off of, um, and off of NASA and off of um, observation. And all of that seems um, really... Well, you understand that the real definition in the Oxford Dictionary of a Scientist says, says nothing about degrees. <clears throat> right. It's, it's a that's process. Why we, that's why we should do away with it. Okay. Uh, I that's sort of like, um, you know, I, I've been playing around with because I was writing about chaos magic. The, um, the, you know, that science comes from the Greek, you know, scientia, the Greek for knowledge. Yeah, and, yeah. To know. And, and that if you, that. I think it's so interesting that, say, in the 18th century, to people like Newton and Kepler and, and their colleagues, there wasn't a distinction between religion and science mm -hmm. or between, between alchemy and chemistry and, um, or between astro astrology and astronomy. And there is the illusion and it's an accurate illusion on one level that we have progressed immeasurably from there through just taking the scientific aspects of those people's work. But in fact, the other, the neglected aspect of their work speaks to something that's, I won't say it's deeper, but it's deep in an entirely different way. And in a sense points towards what you're calling physics or dimensional physics. Well, would you it be points... more comfortable, Richard, if I said metaphysics? Because this is how metaphysics works, at least mm -hmm. according to my model. And we have a resident <clears throat> metaphysician on the show. Her name is Georgia Lambert. She spent over 10 years with Manly Hall, and she teaches classes, mm -hmm. and she's been on the show innumerable times. I'm just thinking we should probably have added her tonight oh. because she looks at what I'm saying and what she knows from her other completely mm -hmm. non-scientific background, and she sees how they fit beautifully together. They sing right, together. I, yeah, you, yeah. I, I read you in part through theosophy. I mean, you're, you're, like, you're like a theosophist in some ways. Oh, um, here we are with labels again. What's this? Okay. Uh, sorry, explain sorry. to people what a theosophist is. Uh, sorry, and and you know what I'm calling a theosophist would just have all the real theosophists up in arms. So <laughs> it probably all I all I meant to say was to corroborate your mention of Manly Hall, and and indicate that when you bring that up, you point to the fact that you're um, it's it's kind of like what you're calling physics is in another sense. Um, sacred geometry, and is another sense kind of hermetic philosophy, and they all kind of, and they all sort of come together. Yes, they do. Those were the languages of this real metaphysics, and mm -hmm. one of the ways that I got 
onto this was as you start looking at NASA and what they do and when they do it, when they launch, when they fly by, when they land, it's according to these deep hermetic so-called secret doctrines with magical numbers and stellar alignments and planetary configurations. It's the most outrageous thing <clears throat> for a supposedly scientific organization in the 20th century until you realize they're operating at two levels. One, the profane, what people look at them and think they're doing, and then the other at a much higher, more esoteric level because they're the space connection between us, Western culture, and everything up and out and around us. The metaphysics. Well, I don't, uh, I don't think... I don't think consciously. No, 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 no. Some consciously, 99.99% not consciously. We agree there. Hey, you know, we're at, we're at another break point. We're at the bottom of the hour, so. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, I want to say something about Sagan when we come oh, back. Oh, by all means. Okay, so just kind of hold it there. My guest this morning is Richard Grossinger. As you can tell, because we uh, do this all the time, we uh, interrupt, <clears throat> we disagree, we, there's, but there's some, and this is why I've so admired Richard's work all these years, because at some weird level, there's this, this strange resonance between what he's been doing, and way that you get into the COVID paper, and what I've been trying to do. And it's that resonance, which is the backbone of tonight's very wide ranging, I guarantee you, seen nothing yet conversation you're on the other side of midnight my name is Richard C Hoagland we shall return the other side of midnight.com Tune in to listen to Richard C. Hogland and his fascinating guests. Support the broadcast and don't miss another groundbreaking conversation. Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive member benefits. Listen to past episodes anytime on any device. Search the archives of over 180 episodes. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought. The other side is midnight.com. Welcome back, everyone. Sunday night, June 6th, in the Land of Enchantment, coming to you live from the great American Southwest, which has many, many, many secrets under its reddish Martian-type soil. My guest this morning is Richard Grossinger, and we're having this uh, wide-ranging conversation at the edge of the known and the unknown. Where do you want to go next? Richard? Hello? I'm not hearing you. Uh, this happened last night. This is very weird. Nothing I've done has changed, yet I cannot hear you. Hmm. Very strange. Um, can anybody hear me? Okay, Kanthea is sending me a note, and um, she's saying, what does she say? Let me let me try something here. Okay, hang on. Of you. Okay, I'm not hearing anything. Yet. All right. Can you hear? Ah, now I can hear you guys. What is going on? I think it's a software issue. So. Okay. Uh, Richard. All uh, right. Well, can you hear me? I can hear everything fine. This happened last night. It just kind of mysteriously cuts out, it's not mechanical, there's nothing broken wires, it's just, it's trembling, it's 
definitely not scientific. 